Hi guys. Um, Anne holds a doctorate of education from Boston University where she studied language development in deaf children. Since 2003, she has worked at Tufts University School of Medicine, directing curricular programs for first and second year students and supporting students with unique accommodations. Anne grew up with several deaf family members and is herself hard of hearing. For fun, she teaches basic American Sign Language classes and is currently training her dogs, Clover and Sasha, to respond to simple sign commands. And would you guys please help me welcoming Anne today. So, I'm talking to you today about deafness, D-E-A-F. You know sign language, you're cool with that, so I can just sign through this presentation, <laughs> joking, okay, <laughs> fine. I will not do that to you. Um, this, these are my dogs, Clover and Sasha. This has nothing to do with the presentation, I just wanted to put it out there. Um, they know a few signs. Um, <laughs> And it's amazing. Uh, I mean, I feel like anybody can learn a few signs if these two can. So this is how you're feeling, and I get it. Um, I'm glad I wore gray to fit with, with all of you this morning. I'm going to try to keep this lively. If you get bored, like raise your hand and ask a question. Um, today, we're going to learn about approaches to understanding deafness. So there's different perspectives. We're going to learn about deaf culture. That's primarily why I'm here. Um, a bit about sign language, American Sign Language. Uh, if we have enough time, I'd like to talk about what it's like for growing up uh, being, as a deaf person or hard of hearing person, and then get into some of the details about deaf education. You all know what this sign is? Yeah! So, if you're loving what I'm saying, feel free to applaud. Okay, here's your pop quiz. You don't have to answer any of these questions, by the way, but I'm just gonna ask them. You can think about it. Some of the answers will be revealed while I'm giving the presentation. So, American Sign Language is a universal language used by deaf people globally. Somebody's shaking their head. You're good, okay. Uh, when the D in deaf is capitalized, deaf, it refers to a cultural and linguistic minority group. In the 1800s, most people on Martha's Vineyard used ASL. Deaf people avoid direct eye contact. A child's use of ASL will delay his or her oral language learning. <laughs> Somebody knows. Okay. Basic vocabulary. Hearing. In sign, this is hearing. Why is this the sign for hearing? Because to deaf people, hearing people speak. Things come out of their mouth. Hard of hearing, H, H, in ASL. A lot of abbreviations you'll see for the deaf and hard of hearing uh, are D, H, O, H, deaf, hard of hearing, or just D, H, H. Late deafened, I would actually fall into that category. I'm losing my hearing, but I'm an older person, late in life, and so I would be considered a late deafened person. So that's different from somebody who's born deaf or who loses hearing early in life. Um, capital D deaf versus lowercase d deaf. Now we're gonna talk about the different approaches to deafness, but those distinctions are important. One way to think about it is on a continuum. So you have on the one hand, hearing culture, and on the other hand, deaf culture. So for the purposes of this talk, we're gonna focus mostly on deaf and hard of hearing. What's interesting is hard of hearing is a term that's used by deaf culture. Lowercase d and late deafened are terms used by hearing culture. What do we mean by that? We'll get into it. 
hearing culture, it's the assumed culture of the United States. Most people can hear. Sp it refers to spoken and oral language and to people who are partially deaf uh, or late deafened. Now, conversely, deaf culture refers to the values and norms of the deaf community. It al almost automatically refers to somebody who uses ASL. And often, um, deaf people are born deaf or become deaf early in life. It also refers to the hearing children of deaf parents, and they're referred to as CODAs, children of deaf adults. Now, can you become a member of the deaf community if you're somebody like me? It's a complicated answer, but you, you can if you embrace the values of the deaf community. Now, I'm gonna talk about different approaches to thinking about deafness. Again, here's that continuum I mentioned. Hearing and deaf, lowercase d on the one hand, and then hard of hearing and capital D deaf on the other hand. So on the far right with the hearing uh, culture, we have a medical approach that seeks to fix or cure deafness. That is the objective. And then somewhere in the middle, we have a more social approach <coughs> that you know, primarily is concerned with accommodations, um, assistive, assisted test technology for deaf and hard of hearing. And then on, on uh, this end, we have the cultural and linguistic approach. And for deaf people, capital D deaf, this, their language is precious, it's a unique culture, and there are social norms that are learned over time. So this is the focus. Now, there's overlap, of course, between these approaches. Um, it isn't, you know, black or white. And kids with cochlear implants, they fall into almost every category. Now, don't do this but I'm gonna tell you how to do it. For a capital D deaf person, we are thinking of these terms as insults because deaf people don't necessarily think of themselves as disabled or handicapped or hearing impaired. And deaf mute is an old term and you don't wanna ever say that. So the question for you right now is, is deafness a disability? You don't have to answer that. You can think about that. Uh, we'll, we'll get a little more into that. Okay, what's deaf culture? There are many elements to deaf culture. Primarily, it's the use of American Sign Language and promoting the use of American Sign Language. Shared experiences, deaf schools, and I highlighted that in red because uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about it if we have time. And it's such a big aspect of deaf culture. What school you went to, who you studied with. Um, it also includes ASL, storytelling, art, drama. There are ASL theater groups. There are AS, uh, the deaf sports teams. There's ASL uh, church services, clubs, and organizations. There's a cartoonist who does that deaf guy and the characters in this cartoon are speaking sign language. Um, and in this particular strip, the little boy is shocked to go to an ASL uh, deaf social where everyone's using ASL. And if you ever had that experience, I don't expect that you have, but uh, it is kind of shocking uh, when you're a kid to experience that. Uh, so deaf culture also includes history of the deaf, which is fascinating. It's a whole other lecture. I'm not gonna bore you with that, but uh, I'll just giving you a little factoid there. Um, in the 1800s, 25% of the population of Martha's Vineyard was deaf. So most people had a deaf family member. Most people learned ASL. Most people were signing and speaking at the same time. Now in that environment, Deafness was not necessarily a disability. It didn't handicap anybody because everybody signed. 
And then there's some role models that are, you know, I mean, you may know who Marley Maitland is. I didn't know this until I was putting this talk together, but Juliette Lowe, she was the founder of the Girl Scouts in the middle uh, of that group there. And then Derek Coleman is an NFL player who is um, hard of hearing. Okay, I'm going to give you some examples of what you might find uh, if you were meeting a deaf person. And one is an introduction, a sign for introduction. So you start out with your name. Does anybody know how to sign their name? Great, okay. So, Anne, <coughs> sign your name. You may also give your sign name, and this would be a name, that, or a sign name, a version of your name that isn't fingerspelled. I took an ASL course a while back, and I was, it also met very early on a Saturday. And I was consistently late to every class. Five minutes, not terrible. I always walked in the door late. And my teacher used to say, you're a little behind. That's the sign for being a little behind. And so my name sign became the letter A and a little behind. And so I would walk in the door, you know, hi. It's like, OK. Um, you also identify where and well, where, where and why you're studying ASL. Uh, many deaf people are curious why a hearing person would want to learn ASL. And other deaf people you know. And then if you want to get a deaf person's attention, you do things like wave a hand in front of their face. You bang on the floor. On a table nearby, you point, you poke them. <laughs> you do things that would be considered rude if you were a hearing person. Now, if you're at a deaf party or a party where there's a lot of ASL speakers, you're going to find that the social norms are a little bit different. So when you want to leave, you're not going to be able to ditch the party easily. You're going to have to say goodbye to everybody. And if you want to get out of there, like in a couple hours, you're going to start saying goodbye. And you're going to go from person to person, and you're going to explain why you're leaving and when you're going to see them again. And I think a lot of this, this particular social norm came about because often people who spoke ASL or deaf didn't see each other very often. And so it was so great to see people. It's when am I going to see you again? This is how I envision many deaf people, is that it's like they're in a desert, and they see somebody who's deaf friendly, knows ASL. And it's like, yes, finally. So there's a concept called deaf time, deaf time. Often deaf people, if they're going to an, a deaf event, will arrive early just to chat with their friends. And then there's these epic goodbyes. And it's, it's funny, and deaf people laugh at themselves about it. Um, but it really makes sense if you realize how significant it is to finally be able to communicate with somebody when you spend most of your time confused or lost in the hearing world. So I want to get into a little bit about American Sign Language. It seems like some of you already know some of this, um, but it's so important for understanding deaf culture. So it's used at the U.S. and Canada. Uh, in England and Australia and New Zealand, they have British Sign Language or the New Zealand Sign Language or Australian Sign Language. It's not the same. So if I see British Sign Language, I don't understand it. Most countries have their own sign language. And there's 200 worldwide. Some of them are pretty similar. Um, you can see that there's connections, but I've seen like Japanese sign language and I don't, I don't see any recognizable signs. 
There's regional differences, so people in California may use a slightly different ASL than people here in Boston. Um, and it, it wasn't even considered a real language until the 1960s. Up until that point, it was just thought, you know, deaf people kind of waved their hands around and made funny faces, and nobody got it. And then it wasn't until the 1970s that, you know, an anthropologists and academics said, you know, we've really got a, a, a unique culture here. This is really different. And I think, you know, what's critical is to understand it's not signed English. Uh, it's, it's a different language, and it's closer to French sign language than it is to English. It has its own grammar, and I don't want to get too much into the linguistics, but the grammar is really different and interesting, and part of it is the facial expressions and the head movements. It also incorporates finger spelling, so there are words that you just finger spell. Job is one of them, and you do it so fast you don't know it's a, a finger spelled sign. Eye contact is a big deal, so um, you know, this is the sign to stare, and it may seem like deaf people are looking too long at you. Why are they not looking away? But they're looking at your face, they're reading your lips if they can. And if deaf people are talking and they want to uh, <laughs> say, look, I'm just tuning you out, eyes are closed. Also, one thing you notice if you're talking with um, people uh, who are deaf and use ASL is that often the communication is very direct, less polite speech, dancing around things. And, you know, you will see some mouth movements that are conventional to ASL, but generally you don't talk and speak while you're signing. A little bit about word order, which is so different from English. A lot of times you put the time first, then the topic, and then it's called the comment. So for example, uh, I need to put down this. Okay. Later, I'll play with a dog. I is the last sign. Later, later, play, and then dog, I. So morning, tired, I, you all understand this, right? Morning, tired, I. And now, wine, want you? It's too early, right? Coffee? Wine, okay. Okay, ASL idioms. This is pretty interesting. Um, the idioms do not usually directly translate from English or from ASL to English. Train, zoom, sorry. Train, zoom, sorry. It means, you know, you just missed it. You missed the boat. Train, zoom, sorry. I'm not going to repeat myself. Burning inside, you know, you're just like really pissed off burning, or on the fence about something. And that, well, here's where you can do it even more obviously. It looks kind of like somebody on the fence, right? Um, so, so far we've talked about approaches to understanding deafness, deaf culture, sign language. Now, let's talk a little bit about growing up deaf or hard of hearing and deaf education. So you see these kids signing here. That's the sign for butterfly. So now you all know the sign for butterfly. All right. This is pretty obvious. How do kids learn language? Hearing kids. This is hearing in sign language. Through their ears, primarily. They see words, but most of their information is coming in this way. Deaf and hard of hearing kids. They're looking. They need to hear through their eyes. That's simple, but it is a very complicated in real life. 
Anybody know who this guy is? Niles DeMarco, Dancing with the Stars, right? I never watched it. Um, but I'm going to let him take over now. Uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about his experience. He's deaf. One is the sensitive period for language develop. He says less than five years. It's about five to seven years. It's a pretty small window of opportunity for kids to be lang learning language. The lack of input, clear stimuli, consistent stimuli, can lead to cognitive delays. And you, you may know all of this. Um, only about five to 10 percent of deaf kids have deaf parents who use ASL. When I was at VU, I had a dissertation uh, advisor who was deaf, and he was one of those lucky kids. Uh, he was deaf, and he spoke just ASL, and I didn't, I wasn't communicating with him always in ASL. I, we, a lot of times we had an interpreter, um, but he was perfectly fluent in both ASL and in English, written English. Now, 30% of hearing parents with deaf kids learn sign, or even less than that. So that's a whole lot of kids who are not getting sign exposure at home. So those kids will come up with ways of communicating, whether it's gesturing, making up signs. And so in many families, actually, you do have made up signs. I'm just going to make two points about cochlear implants because this is definitely not an area of expertise for me. But from my experience, there, there, there are many limitations to cochlear implants. It's not a solution to deafness. The sound quality is limited and it's different for different kids. Some kids <coughs> have a better result with cochlear implants and some kids not so great. And a lot of kids will still want to use ASL even with a cochlear implant. So what about lip reading or speech reading? <clears throat> a lot of people think it's 
something all deaf people do, but really only about or less than 30% of the movements on the lips can be read um, by skilled lip readers. And it is best with some hearing. So I, th I thought we could just kind of test ourselves for a second here. Um, because I've tried this before, but you know, uh, you know, see see how much how much you're getting here. Got it. Belichick's a great example, I think, of somebody who is virtually impossible to uh, understand by trying to lip read because his face is expressionless. <laughs> At least I find it to be. Um, let's see, okay. Let's talk a, a little bit about deaf kids when they go to school and deaf education. There's primarily three approaches. And one is just English only, um, or oral language immersion. It's not real helpful for deaf kids, but it's very common. There's also something called manually coded English, signed English. Has anybody ever heard of that? Um, it's very commonly used with deaf kids. And then there's just, you know, just pure ASL. So a little bit about the English-only environments. Um, there's a concept called oralism, and it's a philosophy for teaching kids, and it's drilling them with oral language. I mean, they're not hearing it, but somehow a lot of people think that kids will figure it out, figure out how to speech read. And it's also based on an idea that learning if, if you learn sign before you learn English, somehow that's going to impede your development, but that's not how it works. Um, the problem with just uh, saying, okay, kids, you're just going to learn to speech read, is it will lead to language deprivation. They're not hearing anything. They're not getting anything out of it, really. And it, it can very often lead to develop, de developmental delays. So this concept's wrong, and there are better ways. Now, a slightly better way is manually coded English. However, there are limitations to that. And you're going to see a bunch of abbreviations like SEE, signed exact English, total communication. And that means you know, you're speaking and signing at the same time. PSE stands for pigeon sign English. And then there's cued speech, which is a whole other method. Now, all of these methods are much easier for hearing people to learn, for parents and teachers. And I understand why they're used, but they don't really work that well with deaf kids. Um, you, you know, it, a lot of it depends on if kids have any hearing whatsoever. Um, but it's almost always the most practical solution. So a much better approach is, it's called bimodal bilingual. Bimodal is with your mouth and with your hands, and bilingual is obviously ASL and English. And the idea is that the kid's first exposure to language is with ASL, and then later they learn English just like any other kid who learns two languages. They get one language first, and ideally it would be ASL. And so they learn to code switch, just like any uh, bilingual person. This is what they do in Sweden, by the way. Uh, and I want to show you, if, how are we doing for time here, uh, another clip of a couple of people who do this. Elena and Rachel. Most parents of deaf children are told that they get one choice in life and that they need to make it right now, ASL or English. We sat down with two deaf women who went against the grain and decided to choose both. Okay. 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 
Elena Mayer was born deaf to a deaf family. She went to a school to learn how to speak, but she still signed at home. My parents, they believed in giving me everything. All of it, all of the skills and all the tools that I'd need. She says that this is what led to her success today. I gave a presentation about a few things and now voting is open. Learning sign from day one has really helped me to develop those skills and understand that language. That helped me develop my skills in English. As a student at CSUN, she does everything any other 20-something would do. She goes to class where she uses her cochlear implant and an interpreter to understand the lesson. She meets with friends at clubs. Who went to the home school? She goes to the gym where she uses today's technology to listen to music. And when she gets home, everyone has different tools in their lives. Maybe it's your glasses or high heels or your cochlear implant. It helps you all throughout the day and you use the tool constantly. But then after a long day, when you arrive home, you take off your glasses or your high heels or your cochlear implant. She says that it's up to the parents to set their kids up for success, whether they be deaf or hearing. You really have to get to know your kids. Do they learn better if they're signing or if they're speaking? If you're not sure, then give them everything and let them decide later in life. But Elena's isn't the only family to have made this choice. We were told you have to pick one and you can't switch. And we absolutely like went against that. We like fought it. It's signing time with Alex and Leah. The award-winning DVD series Signing Time was started by Rachel Coleman, the mother of a deaf daughter. Signing Time's signature teaching sign method combines visual, auditory, and, and hands-on kinesthetic learning. First, you know, we found out she was deaf, she was a year old, and we knew that her, her vision was great and her hands worked, and we had no idea how much she'd be able to hear. Um, it seemed very obvious that we should sign with her. At seven, Leah got her cochlear implant and has learned to talk and hear since. I honestly think my parents raised me the best way they could have. I, I don't think they could have done it any differently. Uh, I, I'm happy with our, our choice and um, the, the options we presented Leah. And I, I really think she does have the best of both worlds. Both women were raised bilingually and said that the freedom to choose and communicate with anyone however they wanted was the biggest benefit to how they grew up. My parents gave me language from a very early age. From day one, I was nonstop signing and I was talking. They gave us everything they could so that way we could communicate the way we wanted. I had that freedom to choose to hear in um, community or the deaf community or both. The only choice their parents had to make from day one was to give them all of the options available to them. So it's interesting too, our, you see the, the kids who are learning ASL and how quickly they pick it up. You know, babies learn ASL at nine months. Their finger dexterity develops before their vocal ability. So a baby can say milk before they can speak milk. But these, uh, Elena and Rachel are really great examples of people who grew up with both ASL and, uh, you know, it, in more mainstream environments. Elena also is shown with a classroom interpreter, which is interesting because, you know, it's, she still needs that help. Uh, okay, so in real life, you're gonna find kids with multiple disabilities. Um, it's not just the hearing, there are many other things going on. They may come from non-English speaking families and that presents another barrier. Um, and then they may have really challenging home lives and very few supports. 
So I think I'll skip this in the interest of time, but this is a really, you can look this up if you're interested in educational interpreters, but um, it's, it's a pretty cool series. I recommend it. Um, so this, this is great. A lot of communication technologies have been such a huge help to the deaf community. And obviously though their usefulness is only as good as their language skills, whether it's ASL or English. So texting, the more English you know, the easier it is, even though you know, texting is very brief. FaceTime is really awesome for, for ASL fluent people. Skype, closed captions, caption phones, voice to text, and then you know, relying on pen and paper helps too. So what, what have we talked about? Elements of deaf culture comes down to identity, without a doubt. I am a part of this community. A shared experience with language and other aspects of not being able to hear. And also embracing a variety of communication techniques. It's not as simple as just knowing a few signs. It's kind of a whole orientation, knowing that you're going to be taking in most information about the world through your vision, through your sight, through what you see. Unique social norms, as we talked about. And then, you know, education focused on ASL. Okay, so back to that question, is deafness a disability? I don't expect you know, a very easy answer to that, but it really depends who you ask. You know, on Martha's Vineyard in the 1800s, deafness was not a disability. I don't think it was conceived of in that way. People knew sign language. Everyone knew a deaf person. So from the deaf perspective, it's limitations within our society, our thinking, our culture that limit the experience that deaf people have. It's not so much intrinsic to them. Okay, now we all know the answers to these questions from the original pop quiz. American Sign Language is a universal language used by deaf people globally. False. No, there's unique sign languages all over the world. I already gave you the answer. <laughs> but you do this by now. This is an easy one. Um, ASL, uh, capital D, deafness, refers to a unique cultural and linguistic minority group. Okay, I messed the slide up and I'm giving you the answer to this one already. In 1800s, most people on Martha's Vineyard used ASL. That's true too. Deaf people avoid direct eye contact. Right, false, okay. A child's use of ASL de will delay his or her oral language learning. False. Okay, I'm almost done. Thank you. Are there any questions? Okay. Um, I had a question about the I'm gonna walk over to you so Sorry. I hear you. <laughs> Um, I had a quick question about the, the cochlear implant. Yeah. How does it work? How does it work? Okay, so most kids uh, who use cochlear implants will have to go through, well, in fact, all of them will have to go through a medical procedure. And a device is implanted in the brain. And did you, do you remember the picture of the kid? You, you have a couple kids here in your program, I think, who have cochlear implants. I'll just show you the picture. It's different than a hearing aid, uh, which amplifies sound. Okay, you see that contraption that sits on the side of the head? That's a magnet. There's a magnet that's implanted <laughs> in the skin, uh, under, under the skin that's over the skull. And that connects this 
piece behind the ear that picks up sound and communicates with what's implanted in the brain. Now, it's complicated, and the reason why there are limitations is that a child, a child's brain, an adult brain, if you have a cochlear implant, they need to learn how to use this technology. Uh, you only have a certain number of auditory channels in your brain, and they have to be triggered by uh, the cochlear implants. So, for example, a normal hearing person will have, I don't, I don't know how many channels, maybe tens of, you know, thousands of channels for diff hearing different types of auditory stimuli. But with a cochlear implant, it's severely limited. So you get basic sounds. You know, I mean, some kids do really well, and they hear almost normal speech and speak normally, but many times it's, the sounds are as basic as just hearing something on a table. Okay, I can hear that, but it doesn't give you a lot of information. You know, they may be able to differentiate voices, dogs barking versus ambulances driving by, but the differentiation of sound isn't there. So I don't know if that really answers your question. I'm not an expert, but it's a really good question. It's complicated technology. A lot of parents with deaf kids feel funny about going through this huge medical procedure with their kids because there's also a rehab process. Kids need to learn how to use their cochlear implants. A lot of them don't like them and just want to take them off all the time. But once they get used to it and use it a lot, just like with a hearing aid, it starts to feel like a part of you and you like it. It's, uh, it helps just to function. <coughs> The difference, so a hearing aid just sits on your ear and amplifies sound. So I have a hearing aid. It just sits here, brings the sound in from the outside and amplifies it so I hear it better because I have hearing on this side. I don't have any hearing on this side. Um, cochlear implant actually has to communicate directly with the brain to tell the brain what the sounds are that are coming in. That's sort of answer the question. I mean, so it's like the difference between having a functioning ear that can sort of hear the sounds and, and transfer that, that sound to the brain through the auditory nerve, or you know, kind of bypassing it with this device. I know you said you taught your dogs sign language. Did they, I know you said you taught your dogs sign language. Yeah. Did they pick up on it fast? And oh, what, yeah, what yeah, age, yeah. What age did they learn? Hmm? What age did they learn? Um, you know, well, it, it also it depends on the dog, you know. So um, <laughs> some dogs are easier to train than others. Um, but, you know, it's just like with kids. The sooner you start, the better. Um, I started with them, let's see, oh, okay, so Sasha, the, the German Shepherd, she's a little bit smarter, easier to train, she knows quite a few of my signs. Um, Clover is not really that kind of dog, um, she knows a few things, she tends to ignore me when I'm signing. Um, she's not so crazy about the signs, but you know, some, so some of it's temperament. I mean, just like with humans, really. Uh, you know, you sort of have to engage with it. Um, you know, it's not like I can sign with them and they'll understand everything. It's like a few basic things. Like, I mean, this is a sign for finish. So, the, you know, this lecture is almost finished. Now, they both, you know, beg for food when I'm eating. And if I'm done eating, I'll say finished, basically stop begging, and they get it. And it's so quick how they pick that up. 
Um, so, you know, some of it's the dog and some of it is just, you know, other factors. Um, I mean, Clover on the right is, I mean, honestly, she's a pain in the ass. <laughs> and so she will ignore a lot of things I say and do. Um, but yeah, I think younger is always better. It's just easier to learn. Anybody else? <coughs> okay, you've had enough. I hope you guys have a great morning. I think what you're doing is wonderful. And thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure.